My name's Abby Odio. I am a former pastor here at Bethany Green Lake. Uh, so good to see those of you that are familiar faces. Good to see those of you um, who are new. So glad that you're here. I can attest this is a great spot. My husband and I are family. We're still members. We worship over now at Bethany West Seattle. Um, but truly, it's just, it's just a joy to be back. I've been looking forward to this all week. So thanks for having me. And if you're joining us online, we're super glad to have you as well. Uh, this week is our third in a series on the book of First John, which is kind of this short but really mighty word uh, written to a church at what you could say is a kind of critical point in their history. Um, this last week on Monday, I sat down to do some sermon prep, um, and I've done enough of this now where I have my routine, right? I'm studying First John chapter 3, and I like it to go a certain way. I have a particular chair that I sit in, different things that I do, um, and so just for some backstory, we also, a year ago, our basement flooded. Any of you who have gone through that joy, you know it's quite a journey. Uh, so we had some folks who were working on the basement, and um, they were starting on Monday. And so I'm in my chair, I've got my routine, trying to get in the zone, and all of a sudden I hear, like, what can only be described as like a 747 engine. Just that kind of all-encompassing, like, whoa, shocking sound, right? Uh, I'm crank up my music, uh, a couple minutes later, uh, jackhammer, like on concrete, is shaking the whole house, right? I turn Bob Dylan up a little bit louder. I'm sitting there. I'm committed to this chair. Fast forward a few minutes, my husband, Sam, walks in, and he just laughs. Walks in, I might add, from his outdoor de detached office, uh, unconnected to the house, and he just kind of laughs at me, sort of kind of pityingly. And he said, why don't you go, God bless him, why don't you go work in my office? And I said, no, I got to sit in my chair. This is like the Holy Spirit chair. <laughs> That's terrible theology. So don't make that your takeaway today. But I'm committed to this chair, right? So um, he laughs, he leaves. He comes back a couple minutes later with these huge headphones, right? And he says, at least try these. And he takes his fancy headphones and places them on my head and immediately I'm in the zone. Like, I don't know what he said after that. It could have been a commercial for whatever brand this product is because they were noise canceling headphones and they worked. I could still feel the jackhammer under my feet, but it was, um, it was okay after that. And I tell that story because in some ways it paints for us a picture of what First John, um, the book in general, but specifically chapter three does for us. The author of this book addresses a church that is facing an unspecified problem. They were not living in easy times. The way of faithfulness is not clear. Folks are, we know are feeling disheartened. Like maybe following Jesus doesn't matter all that much given the circumstances they find themselves up against in the world. And this letter is written amidst those kind of loud and disheartening circumstances to remind this little network of churches that following Jesus doesn't just make a difference, it makes all the difference. It's like a pa the pastor who wrote 1 John is placing these noise-canceling headphones on them and bringing them back into the zone, right? Orienting them once again towards the person and the calling at the center of their faith. And our study of this text is so timely because we exist at a moment that can feel utterly disheartening. Every day we hear fear, words like fear, injustice, division, anxiety. These are words used to describe the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. And so today as we study these words, this is our moment, so to speak, of slipping on the headphones. We're ushered into this different kingdom reality. And it's not separate from the one we see in the news each day, but it's deeper and it allows us to then return to that world and live differently as people of hope who have been reminded of what it is we're called to be and do in the world and who God is. So that's where we're going today. And as we study this passage that John Wayne read for us, you'll notice that a word that continually comes up in chapter 3 is this word we're all very familiar with, it's love. That word love is actually used nine times in this chapter. And so the three encouragements we're gonna look at today are all centered on this word. And they are this, see the love of God, 
like the choir just sang so beautifully for us, abide in the love and live as love. Let's pray and then we'll study God's word together. Holy Spirit, um, I just pray for something fresh for us this morning, that your words would meet us wherever we are at in this, on this day, in this time, um, places of discouragement, places of joy, places where we feel like we're stuck, places where we're cruising, wherever we find ourselves, God, may this word find us, challenge us, transform us, encourage us to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so I want to begin with this first encouragement, which is to see God's love, to see God's love. Notice uh, the first chapter in verse three says this, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called God's children. And that is what we are because the world did not recognize him. It does not recognize us. Now I find the particular language here really interesting Notice uh, the author invites us to see not just the love God has for us, but specifically he says, what kind of love God has for us. Now, not unlike our day, it would seem there are different ways of understanding that word, that notion, love. It's a word that gets thrown around and used a lot. And the author here wants to be sure that we get it right, that we truly see. And this isn't a general or sentimental love. It's a kind of love specific to the God of the universe. Now, if we, if we survey the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that's used to talk about love is a word, ahava, ahava. And it can be applied in different contexts to describe kind of the care or affection one person has for another. For instance, ahava is used to talk about the king of Persia's love for Queen Esther. It's also used to talk about the parental love that Abraham has um, for Isaac. In the story of David and Jonathan, Ahava becomes the powerful love that exists between friends. But it's also used to talk about the love God has for humanity. There's this key moment in Deuteronomy chapter 7 where Moses, who is leading God's people, says to them, God showed affection for you because of his Ahava for you. It's kind of circular reasoning, right? In other words, he didn't choose you because of anything you've done. This ahava is not earned. Rather, this love originates from God's own character. God loves because God loves. This is why the prophet Jeremiah could say, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God's ahava has no end because it has no beginning. It just is. And this nature of this ahava that originates in God, it's both a feeling that God has towards us Right? We know from books like Hosea where God's love's compared to kind of this romantic feeling or longing that God does feel something towards us, but it's not just a feeling, it's also an action. Ahava is something God does. We read in Deuteronomy that it's because of God's great love, he frees the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And if you pay close attention while reading the scripture, one of the things you'll notice is that people who encounter this love, people who bump up against it, they have great difficulty actually putting words to it, right? We see this in Psalm 139. The author tries to explain the nature of this love, and he says, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go down to the depths, you are there. As if to say this love, it's so inexplicably present, And the best part of the psalm comes at the very end where the author makes this very human confession. He admits, your ever-present love, it's too much for me. It's too lofty. I can't understand it. Now, I think if, if any of us are honest with ourselves, we can share in that sentiment. This idea that God, the ahava of God is eternal, is the truest of all true realities, we might be able to agree with that sort of intellectually or philosophically, But personally, the notion of eternal love, we're not naturally wired to see it. We have two kids. Our older son, Mark, is in preschool. And uh, I picked him up this week. And I said to him, buddy, how was school today? You know, that question you always ask. And he said, good. It was Mathematician Thursday. And I said, that's great. What'd you learn? And he said, I learned that the smallest number is one. And I was like, awesome. What's the biggest number? He said, that's easy. 100. And I said, well, that's the interesting thing about numbers is that no matter how big of a number you pick, there's always 
a bigger one beyond that. And he said, what, how is there a bigger number past 100? And I said, that's a great question. You should ask your teacher tomorrow. But in a way, this is similar to how we are kind of bound in our thinking about a concept like love. We understand it to be limited. 100, that's the maximum, right? I know God is generous, but there is always a limit, always a point, always a line that if I cross or if others cross, surely God ceases to act with great affection for me or for them. And we understand this to be true because most of our lived experiences have affirmed that love is not an eternal reality. Um, And if we are going to believe that, we're naive, we're just going to set ourselves up for disappointment, And so what often happens for me is I talk about the eternal love of God, but I live as though that love is very much confined. My MO for what that love looks like is different than the actual kind of love God has. We uh, spent last weekend in Phoenix. We were visiting uh, my husband's extended family that lives there. And while we were there, they took us to this massive aquarium. It was crazy. We have this photo that I'm going to show you. And I'm showing you this photo because I paid $40 for it. (laughs) In a moment of sincere weakness. um, And now I'm making up for it by making sure others see it. Um, So that's us. We had a great time. And no joke, at this aquarium, they have a shark tank right in the middle of the desert. It's wild, and it's full of water, as you would imagine, and it's huge, and there's all these different kinds of sharks swimming around, and the kids loved it, like more than screen time. It was crazy. And um, my younger son, our younger son, Fritz, who's three, was standing in front of the shark exhibit for an extended period of time, just entranced, you know? And I'm standing next to him, watching everyone swim about in there, and he turned to me, and he said, Mama, what do sharks eat? And I said, uh, well, I think they eat fish. And he said, oh, well, what do the fish eat? I said, well, that's a good question. I think they eat smaller fish. I'm not a marine biologist, so if I'm wrong, you can correct me or not. But, um, and I saw where this was going. He said, well, what do the small fish eat? And I said, well, I think they eat like little teeny tiny plants that are kind of floating around in the water. And um, he said, oh, okay. And then he waited, he's thinking, thinking. He said, well, mom, who eats the shark? And I said, that's a good question. You know, I don't think anyone, anything eats the shark. I think the shark's kind of the king of the sea. And the kid did not skip a beat. He said, I want to be a shark. (laughs) He's three, he's not even potty trained, right? (laughs) Now, I tell that story, I kept thinking about that story Because it's interesting that our longing to be safe, this human longing to be safe, to be loved, translates even as a three-year-old into this need to exist on the top of the food chain, to not be the smallest fish. And so often it's this kind of thinking that gives shape, even subtly so, to how we understand the favor and the affection and the ahava of God. Conditional, limited, an additive here and there, but only for a select few and only when I or they get it right. This is the the essence of that story in the Gospel of John chapter 6. It's one of my favorite stories. Jesus is teaching to this large crowd of people, right? And there's a little boy and he's got the fish and he's got the loaves and nobody has any food. And and the little boy comes forward and, and Andrew, who's one of the disciples, says what we all would say. That's no use to us. There's not enough to go around. Are you crazy? Andrew hasn't yet learned to see the kind of love God has. It's eternal. It's enduring. It can feed and sustain without running out. But we live like it cannot. I live like it cannot. We live like our lovability and safety is attached to things like how I perform or how my kids perform, right? The size of my home. One of our favorites in the church right now, my sexual orientation, as if somehow that could rule me out. How generous or good I am, how liberal or conservative I am, how well I feel, how my body is, my, my degrees, my looks. This is how our world thinks about love. And this is why First John 1 says, the world did not recognize this God who came because he loved so differently because we were so stuck in this other paradigm. So we begin with asking ourselves, do we see this kind of love? Like, do we really actually see it? Or are, are we deceived into to looking at love like the world does? 
Interestingly, one of little Fritz's favorite songs is this old hymn he learned at uh, Bethany over in West Seattle. And one of the, the lyrics to the hymn goes, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. And he'll walk around. He's got a big head. He'll walk around just singing it in the house. It's so funny. Um, but I think about that line a lot. You have love like an ocean in your soul when you've learned that in God's kingdom, love isn't worked for. It isn't an additive, but it's the very ocean we swim in. There's no getting out of it, not even for sharks. That's why the gospel is so offensive sometimes. And the point of this little book is first and foremost to locate us in those waters, to give us a renewed vision for God's Ava. And that brings us to the second essential invitation from our text, which is this, we are called to abide in God's love. If we keep reading 1 John chapter 3, we come to verse 12, which is interesting. It says this, don't behave like Cain who belonged to the evil one. And murdered his brother. And why did he kill him? He killed him because his own works were evil, but the works of his brother were righteous. Now this kind of allusion to Cain and Abel, it takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain is older, Abel's younger. Cain is in agriculture, Abel works with the animals. And they both bring offerings to God as kind of this way of worshiping and thanking God. Cain brings plants, Abel brings firstborn animals. And we read that God looks favorably on Abel's offering. And there's a lot of speculation about why that is. But here's the truth. The text doesn't really say. If you read that story, God just kind of picks Abel's offering. Now here's the thing. God doesn't love Cain any less. He just preferred what Abel brought. And this is upsetting, kind of understandably, right? It's upsetting. It's angering. It's saddening. The text literally says he was depressed, That's Cain. And seeing Cain's disposition, God shows up kind of compassionately to reassure him. And he says this, he says, sin is lurking at your door. Its desire is for you. One translation said it's ready to strike. Now, this is really interesting. This is the first time that word sin is used in all of scripture. And notice it's not used to speak about a particular behavior. It's talked about as this personified and deceptive force That if Cain is not careful, will convince him of the illusion that God's love for him is somehow limited. And in some ways you could say the whole of the rest of scripture is God's work helping his beloved world learn to abide, learn to stay situated in that love. Not to just see it once, but to to come back to it again and again and again. And this ability to abide, it makes all the difference. We don't just do this once like presumably Cain did. That would be like saying, you know, I ate dinner last night and it was amazing and good and now I'm good for all eternity. That's not how it works. We come to the table. We come back to food again and again. Now, if you read the story of Cain and Abel in the Hebrew, the sentence structure is actually quite strange. After God warns Cain that sin is crouching at his door, we're told Cain spoke to his brother Abel. It's kind of dot, dot, dot. Like literally in the Hebrew, the sentence just sort of falls off. In our English translations, we tidy it up so it makes more sense with the story. But in the Jewish tradition, they embrace that awkward kind of pause. And they go further to imagine what might be happening during that pause, that beat where Cain has this choice about which truth he will locate himself within, right? Will he trust that God's love is sufficient, pervasive enough to make him whole and abide in it? Or will he believe the deceit? Will he let jealousy and insecurity have the final say and lead him towards that shark-like way of being? See, who Cain will be towards his brother is entirely dependent on where he chooses to abide in that pause, It sounds so easy when we put it that way, but this is hard. Cain and Abel were offspring of Adam and Eve who had unfortunately not trusted God's best, God's guarding, God's love. And we are also inheritors of thousands of generations of love, none of which is perfect. And usually we use that word abide to talk about God, but we can abide in any story, right? We can make a habit of trusting and returning to any story, not just God's. And for most of us, after years of abiding in sort of those lesser deceptive stories of love, even well-intentioned and good enough ones, we return to them without even thinking about it. It becomes our second nature to abide there. 
So much so that when we make an effort to more consciously abide in God's love, it might feel uncomfortable or frightening or too soft to lean into. Because this, this kind of abiding, it does not look like work. It does not look like control. It does not look like beating out your brother or sister. It does not look like grit. It does not look like achievement. It looks like surrender. It looks like giving up all that we've convinced ourselves love is predicated on. For Cain, it was the offering and not necessarily to walk away from those things altogether, but walk away from what we've come to believe they can do for us. I love how uh, Father Richard Rohr talks about this kind of surrender and abiding in God's love. He says, you cannot get to such a place. You can only rest and rejoice in such a place. Again and again. There's a, another writer also named Richard Foster, and he tells a story that I think just highlights what this looks like kind of on a practical level, this abiding he recalls this time he was in a grocery store that was very busy, kind of picture Costco on a Saturday morning, which unfortunately is when my family always tends to be there. Um, but it's just chaos, right? It's busy. There's noise. Um, anyway, there's a small boy in a cart who's just having a hard time. He's unhappy and he's yelling out. And the man pushing the cart, presumably his father, just keeps saying over and over to himself very calmly, it's okay, Danny. We're almost done, Danny. You can do this, Danny. Just repeats those words, right? And a shopper nearby leaned over to the man and said in kind of this good nature tone, is your son, Danny, having a bad day? And the man responded, my son's name is Nathan. My name is Danny. <laughs> and I like that story because it's funny. But it also shows us the power of abiding in higher truths in a given moment. In a deeper reality, a truer reality. It would be understandable for Danny to get sucked into the chaos and the frustration and, you know, the difficulty of his kid who probably hadn't slept well the night before. But instead, he chooses to abide elsewhere. Chooses to not get sucked in. How do you, how do we abide? What do we do to stay connected during the noise and the chaos of it all to the reality of God's love? One small thing you might consider doing this week is simply to embrace that pause. To notice when judgment of self or others or insecurity or cynicism or aggression wells up within you to notice that, to pause and then abide. To pause and then abide. I said that over and over during the first service and all I could think of was bend and snap for those of you who are millennials in the room. <laughs> but that pause and abide. Abiding might um, be a brief meditation, a reminder to yourself, I'm held in God's kind of love. You could say it aloud like Danny did. Abiding might look like picking up a Bible or finding 1 John 3 and reading it once or twice to yourself. Sam, uh, my husband, always says that he knows when I'm really mad at him after a fight because he'll come to what, wherever I am and I'll have hymns playing on the speaker. And he's like, oh, it's bad. I'm like, just waiting for the water to turn to wine, honey. You just go on about your day. But it's a way of abiding, right? A way of staying connected to this truer, deeper reality that we're held. Um, I'd encourage you, if something's come to mind, just jot it down. What can you do? Make this practical. Now, as we keep reading uh, our chapter for today, it becomes so clear that our abiding in God's love is not just about our personal wholeness, but about this calling to live as love. That's the third point, live as love. The author of 1 John writes this, he says, little children, let's not live with words or speech, uh, but with action and truth. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and reassure our hearts in God's presence. I just finished reading a really interesting book by this uh, social commentator named Krista Tippett. She's a uh, host of podcasts as well. Some of you might know her. But it's, there's a whole chapter on love. It's really provoking. And she writes this. She says, what is love? And then she says, answer that question with the story of your life. And in a way, I think she is echoing the words of 1 John. We can speak all day about love. We can, we can like hold it up as a value as a church. We can attach all sorts of words to it in a sermon. But our truest beliefs about love are not revealed in what we think or speak or write, but in what we do, in the action we take in loving others. 
And the hard truth of Cain's story is that he will become an expression of the story in which he abides. He goes on to kill his brother in a field, and it's the first death ever recorded in the Bible. We've seen a lot of death lately in our nation. Tragic gun violence. There was a, um, an article last week in the New York Times. It was an opinion piece, and it spoke about each of the individual perpetrators of kind of this last just heart-wrenching, I mean, horror. What do we call it? And the point the author was making, the author's a trained psychologist, is that each of these men had something in common. They were living in utter despair. One existed in total isolation with literally no friends to speak of. Like they tried to find people who knew this man who could say something about him. They couldn't. Another one uh, thought his family was trying to poison him. Now hear me out. This is not an attempt to justify their actions or excuse them in any way. And I know gun violence must be addressed on multiple levels, um, you know, including legislation, including support for mental health. But when we read in 1 John 3 that the person who does not love remains in death, this is not metaphorical language. It's describing the way things are. It's describing what all too often happens when someone gets stuck in a deceptive paradigm where love is conditional or love is absent. Instead of being an expression of God's love to the world by willing the good of others, we take from them. Hopefully not their lives, but we do this in small ways too. We, we take from them in our thoughts that we have about them or, or the way we talk about them with other people. We take from them in how we you know, make assumptions about groups of people that we, we know nothing about. And this is where our ability to live in a way that tells the story of God's kind of love is ever so necessary. See, it's hard to accept that we will become a lived expression of the story in which we abide, especially when horror and tragedy and heartbreak happens. But friends, hear this. In these, the most difficult times in recent history, this is the best and most hopeful news. We will become a lived expression of the story in which we abide. And friends, the love of God offered in Christ is unlike any other story. God sent Jesus because he had such great ahava for the world. You, say he, you could say he was counting. He got to 100 and he said, there's still more. There's still another number after that. And Jesus enters our world, the very embodiment of love, and feeds people and heals them and befriends them. And then those very same people he so loves put him on a cross. And in our conception of love, we think that's it. We've counted all the way to a thousand. This must be it. And Jesus looks his killers in the face and says, no, there's still a bigger number. Here's my forgiveness. And after that, he ascends into hell, and we think for sure this is it. We're at a million now. No one counts past a million. But this Jesus, three days later, defeats death and evil as if to say, I'll take it for you. I'll take that sin crouching at your door. There is more love to give. There's still a bigger number. And as we begin to actually see this, really see the kind of love God has, as we begin to rest and rejoice in it, something fundamental in how we exist in the world. It begins to shift. We can't help it. Having paused to receive this love, we're no longer pressured into living like sharks, right? The community begins to change. We see this in that early community that John's writing to. In that day, slavery was commonplace. Roman slaves were said to be non-habens personum, which literally means they have no face. And this little group of Jesus followers changed by God's love, they would get over kind of the politics of their little community and open their doors and these people who'd been called slaves the whole life would sit down and they'd wash their feet. It was so countercultural. They didn't dole out love to people deciding who was worthy of it and who wasn't. They swept people up into this story. It's like Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, I love this. He said, Jesus was not so much written into history as it, uh, Jesus was not so much written as it was plowed into his, the history of the world. The name of Jesus was plowed into the history of the world. 
And friends, historically, at its very best, the church has been this, a force of love shocking the world. In ancient times, plagues were really commonplace. You know, we're familiar with this now, but they would come and they would just kill huge swaths of people. And the sentiment would be one of panic. There was no guidance in, you know, the writings of Homer, uh, no commands from the Greek god Zeus about how to care for the dying. Um, One historian wrote about the plague in Athens and he said they had no one to look after them. Indeed, there were many houses in which all the inhabitants perished through lack of any intention or care. But enter into the world, this new little community changed by love whose souls were so immersed in that ocean. They followed a man who would touch people considered unclean with leprosy. A man who told his disciples, go towards the sick. And so they lived that love. A bishop named Dionysus who lived in the third century would later write about their actions during the plagues. He said, heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick. They, they gave up their own lives. They were infected by what others, um, because they draw, drew near to these people. The sickness of their neighbors, they accepted cheerfully. Fast forward now to the post-Civil War area in our own nation. Although slavery was outlawed, equality for black people was far from achieved. During this time, a deeply evil practice called lynching became a reality for some 5,000 mostly black men, some black women. That means they they were killed. Most of them hung, some of them beaten without a trial by a mob, generally a mob of white Christian men. And during this time, a woman, a black woman named Ida B. Wells, she would live out love amongst other incredible things. She took up journalism. In 1892 in Memphis, a black woman, she founded a newspaper devoted to unmasking the horrors of lynching. She investigated these events. She wrote about them. She made sure everyone in the nation knew what was happening. And then she wrote in her journal, I love this. She said, it may be unwise to express myself so strongly but I cannot help it. And I know not if capital may not be made against me. In other words, it may cost me my life. And then she'd said this, but I trust God. I'm swimming in a different ocean. I wonder sometimes what the historians and theologians of the future, what will they say about us? What will they say about our love? Will it shock the world? Will it hold the same eternal, unthreatened, unmoved, embodied confidence? And I wonder about it, hear me, not in a shaming way, but in an inviting way. We are called to something exciting and moving and good. There is a way forward for us in these chaotic times. And we don't have to start a newspaper, but we can, we can start by loving our literal neighbor, right? Learning, learning their names, Start by, you know, loving our kids where they're at, not trying to sculpt them into little successful versions of the person we maybe wish we had been. (laughs) I get that. I feel that. Start by leaning into the injustices of our time, not by asking, what does my political party think, which is so tempting for me at the front of the line, but rather ask the question, how would Jesus love in this situation? Because trust me, that will challenge every political regime in the world. But really, before any of that, we start by coming to this table. Together as a church, today, that's where we start. What is love? We answer that question with the story of our life. And Jesus answered that question with the story of his life. Before Jesus said, go and heal, he said, come and eat. This is my body, a sign of my love given for you. All are welcome here who desire to be be fed. I think of the words of St. Augustine who said, Christ is bread looking for hunger. And so we're invited to bring our deep hunger to this table of Christ again and again and again to abide here. And as we do that this morning, I'd encourage you to practice that pause Just right now in real time, is there another paradigm, another lesser deceptive paradigm of love that you've kind of found your way into? A paradigm that says you must be this or that. A paradigm that's limited in scope and like Cain only leads to, you know, jealousy or judgment of self and others or violence. If you're able to identify what that might be, I'd invite you to just kind of name it in conversation with God and then to come forward and receive communion. 
It's going to be real fun with a group this size. You're going to enter, exit your pew out the left. You're going to go counterclockwise. Those of you in the back, my left, your right, those last five rows, if you want to come all the way to this front corner, that would be good because I think there's more of you on this side, so that will hurry things along. Um, But as we do this, uh, I'd invite you to take the bread on your own and then wait before you drink the cup. We'll drink the cup together before we leave. Um, But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. And then he took the, the cup and he poured it. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, this new story. It's an old story, but now it's a new story. Given for the forgiveness of your sins. And every time you as a church come together and receive these elements, which were very common elements, people would have been doing this all the time. Abide in the truth. Abide in the truth. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you just for this tradition, this table, this space. God, thank you that in your great wisdom, you knew we were people who would lose sight of the very ground we stand on. And so you said, do this thing all the time. Do it. Keep coming back. You'll get off track. It's going to (laughs) happen. But return to my love. So God, we return to it in this moment. We receive it as the truest thing about our lives. And it's not just a, it's not just a general love. It's a love particular to each of us. We receive it. We say, thanks for it. Help us to get it. And then we ask God that as we step into your love, we would be changed. That we would be people who, who love more like you. That, that we wouldn't just hoard this meal for ourselves, but we would, we would say, there's a seat. Come sit next to me. Let me show you what this God is like. God, what a gift it is to be your children. In Jesus' name we pray. 